Hello and welcome to the Good Robot Andy's Season 3, Episode 7. My name's Andy Balaam and this is... Uh, Andy Cockerill. And uh, this evening we'll be talking about a film called... Swiss Army Man. Or Swiss, Swiss. Army Man, depending on where you are in the United Kingdom. I just added Swiss a Somerset Army R to that. Army. Swiss, Swiss Army, Army Man. Man. Swiss Army Man. <laughs> Um, and that, uh, uh, what I do is I tell you the summary of the plot without having watched the film, based purely on the title, which I heard um, 30 to 40 seconds ago, <laughs> um, meaning that this is quite spontaneous. Um, I think that this is a white film. There's a lot of snow, and it's about a lonely man who can't find his place in the world. Hmm. That's okay. it. <laughs> That's all I got. All Is that right? right. Uh, well, you're kind of right about the lonely man who can't find his place in the world. Mm-hmm. But it's not set in the snow. Okay. It doesn't feature well, the important anyone from the Swiss Army. <laughs> oh, not even one. Not even one. Although they... I believe that the Swiss Army are... Um, the official Vatican Guard. I think that's correct. Really? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, presumably because, because you know, because the Swiss are neutral and all that kind of thing. I I don't know why. It's probably there's probably a historical reason for it. Um. That's in the nature of reasons that indeed. they are generally historical. So <laughs> yes, they are. Um. So Swiss Army Man is a 2016. So it came out last year last summer, mm-hmm. American comedy drama film, mm-hmm. written and directed by Daniel... Comedy? I wasn't expecting comedy. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, by Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinart. Scheinert, I think. It stars Paul Dano, uh, Daniel Radcliffe, who's quite well known, I think, Daniel Radcliffe. He's been in a few movies. Wasn't he a Radio 1 DJ? I think he was. Oh, no, that's, are you thinking about... Um, are you thinking Mark about Radcliffe. Bruno Brooks? <laughs> I'm not thinking about Bruno <laughs> Brooks. <laughs> I'm thinking about Mark Radcliffe. That's different. Oh, yeah. Okay. And yeah. Um, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Uh, and the film had its premiere at the, at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival and opened last summer. So, But definitely isn't a summer blockbuster. It's not that kind of thing. So... Uh, Paul Dano plays a man called Hank, who is tra- who is stranded on an island. Um, I think somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. It's never actually specified where the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Um, so he just it just opens. Yeah, and he's on an island. He's on an island. He's stranded on an island. He, we don't know why. Uh, no, we don't. We're just thrown into this situation, mm-hmm. um, and he's about to. Uh, he's about to kill himself because he seems to have lost all hope. Okay. When he sees a corpse washed ashore. And that fills him with hope. No, well, that makes him think that maybe there's uh, this corpse might have a telephone on them or something like that that he can use. Mm-hmm. Um, and this corpse is played by Daniel Radcliffe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, who's been in a few good films. And... He develops a friendship with the dead body and discovers that he can manipulate the dead body like a Swiss army knife. Because I'm starting to see why this isn't a summer blockbuster. It's definitely not a summer blockbuster, <laughs> no. Um, okay. And the first thing that he does... Uh, this is going to be spoilery, by the way, listener. If you, yeah. if you haven't if listened you... to this show, this podcast before... Then what are you doing? We're three seasons in. Three seasons. This is the seventh episode. Yeah, it's true. That's a good point, actually. Yeah. Mm. Um, Although, to be honest, we're probably looking to pick up listeners since since we've got a maximum of one. That's true. So. Yes, listener. Yeah. yeah. You, you could tell your friend. Tell your friends. Tell all your friends. What are you? I'm Batman. I think... Um, I think we are. I think we are. Listener's friend. We are Batman. <laughs> and we already know about this <laughs> podcast. So the first thing he does is he realises that this corpse is filled with air and it keeps filling up with air because it's, you know, rotting from the inside and generating gas. 
Mm-hmm. So he uses the air in the corpse um, to drive him to the next, to the mainland, which isn't actually all that far away, but he can't swim to it. Uh, and so the air comes out of the corpse's bottom like a massive fart mm-hmm. and uh, pushes him across the water like he's on a boat, like he's on a speedboat or something. How is this played? Uh, very jokingly. It's played definitely played broadly. You know, it's not like you could definitely do this. <laughs> Okay. It's funny, you know. It's is he on a raft, or is he just sitting? No, on he's the sitting on the corpse, and it's propelling him across the water uh, with an enormous fart. Okay. <laughs> so they get back to the to the mainland, but he's still a long way from civilization, even though he's on the mainland. And <clears throat> as uh, it's raining a lot, as it does in the northwest of the United States, and they're hiding in a cave and some water pours into Daniel Radcliffe's mouth and um, Paul Dano's character, who's called Hank, realises that the corpse has the ability to act as a well for drinkable water. So he can save water in there, basically. <laughs> <coughs> How is that played? Uh, it's played like, well, you can do this. Kind of thing. I mean, everything in this is played like you can do this, and and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, he also imagines that the corpse can speak, right? Which oddly enough speaks with Daniel Radcliffe's voice in an American right. accent, mm-hmm. um, and has, you know, a kind of a grasp on the English language. And he adopts the name Manny. So it's Hank and Manny uh, okay. having adventures. Um, but Manny has forgotten everything about his former life. So Hank has to teach him all about the modern world. And, <clears throat> um, you know, he, he teaches him the way, a way to behave in the modern world that isn't necessarily correct, but is amusing. <laughs> Um, and he teaches him all about the joys of eating out, going to the going to the movies, partying, and kind of makes up um, uh, like uh, puppet shows to show him how people interact in the real life. And Hank leads Manny to believe that he is in love with a woman called Sarah who rides the same bus as him every day on her own. Um, And that they're kind of boyfriend and girlfriend, but uh, they've kind of broken up. Mm -hmm. And, but it transpires that Hank has actually been stalking this woman and she's married and she's got a kid and they're not together and he's just... You know, a bit socially awkward. He's actually been following her on social media and Mm -hmm. stalking her. So they, yeah, yeah. This is is the weirdest film we've talked about. It really is strange. It really is strange. But I'll, I'll go back. Actually, I'll go back to when I heard about this, you know, being released and... To, you know, hearing the, the stars talk about it and the directors talk about it and I just thought you know of all the stuff that I've seen all the movies that I've seen in my life which is you know quite a few um, this sounds like something that I could connect with because it's so weird it's so <laughs> offbeat mm-hmm. and yet it it although it plays some of the stuff quite broadly it plays most of it straight down the line it's not winking at you and it is portraying Hank's, um, you know, Hank's clear social awkwardness and his inability to connect with people. It portrays it in a in a sympathetic way. You know, it doesn't set him up as a weirdo and, okay. then, and then set you against him. It definitely wants you to try and sympathise with with his his life and um, you know his. This relationship that he has with this corpse, played by Daniel Radcliffe, is actually quite touching. It's quite, um, it's quite powerful in in a way, 
because you know he has terrible difficulty connecting with real people uh-huh. and he uh it, you know here you've got someone who's never going to talk back to you effectively but also can save you when you're in a tight spot so uh okay come on i need to know what happens okay so they get back to civilization uh, i won't tell you how because i do actually want to leave something unspoiled in this story i think i've oh, really I've, yeah i think so i think i've given away quite a bit there so they get back to civilization and they go to this woman who's called sarah they go to her house and um she uh naturally calls the police on them and uh hank can't really explain how he got there but um the uh he runs off with manny when the police arrive uh, Manny falls down a big hill. They fall down this big hill towards the beach. Manny falls in the water, and then uh, he um, he violently farts again, and then flies across the ocean, uh, seeming to be smiling at Hank one last time. <laughs> <laughs> It's a truly, okay. truly bizarre film, but it, what, 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 what? I think what makes it work is the the direction is really good. It's re, it it, um, it doesn't labour the point, mm-hmm. and the but the, what really makes it work is the central performances of Paul Dano, who's been great in other things. Um, I really enjoyed him in a, a movie called Love and Mercy, which is all about. The, uh, the Brian Wilson, the sort of driving force behind the Beach Boys. Mm-hmm. It's set in two time frames. So it's set during the recording of Pet Sounds, uh, which was, you know, the thing that drove Brian Wilson over the edge into mm-hmm. sort of drug psychosis and um, rec- recluse, made him a recluse. Mm-hmm. And it's set also in the 1980s when Wilson was um, under the care of a a doctor called Eugene Landy who um, had control over basically complete control over Brian Wilson's life from the drugs and alcohol that he had from the food that he ate to the people that he, that he could speak to and seemingly had some kind of control over his money as well um, so it's set in those two time frames and Paul Dano plays the the Pet Sounds era Brian Wilson and mm-hmm. just absolutely nails the character. It's absolutely incredible performance. So, and in this, um, he is the you know he's the beating heart of the film. He's he's a man for who seemingly has extreme difficulty relating to the real world and relating to people. And we don't know why he's on this island, but he doesn't seem at all happy. Um, and but Daniel Radcliffe. Uh, is is incredible. I mean, this is a this is a role that I think most leading actors would probably pass on, mm-hmm. but he embraces it and he is really, really excellent. I mean, I've I've seen so, Radcliffe in some good stuff lately. I watched him in a movie called Imperium, in which he plays a, a an undercover FBI agent, and he's really great in that as well. So. Um, mm. I think uh, I think that's that's what that's what's the beating heart of the film is the performances. So this is a metaphor, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. For like being bad with people. It is absolutely that, yeah. Absolutely that. That's that that's what the film is all about. It's about a man struggling to to interpret the world and struggling to interact with people. Yeah, it's absolutely about that, yeah. And it, and I think in that respect, it succeeds brilliantly because it does communicate those things. And it's it is moving. It, it I found it to be very powerfully moving in places. Um, Did you watch the series about the family of Undertakers? Uh, Six Feet Under. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you th- that had dead bodies in as well. Yeah, they kind of phase that aspect of it out after a while, don't they? But 
it it's quite heavily played in the first couple of seasons that the uh, I'm sp- we're spoiling six feet under for people now. Or it's okay if you haven't seen it by now. Tough. I mean, yeah. It basically content warning. It will depress you <laughs> it badly. Is, yeah, it is intensely depressing, isn't it? I found the first series sort of inspiringly depressing. Yes. And as it moved off death onto just the agony of having to coexist with other humans. Yeah. I couldn't watch it anymore. Couldn't you? No, I watched it to the end. Uh, I mean, well, it's just awful. Like when everyone's just hurting each other and in so much pain. Mm. It's just, it's horrible. Yeah. But it's well made. And it, it does reflect yeah, it is. You know, some people's reality. Um, yeah. c- certainly... Um, That's why it's horrible. It wouldn't be horrible if it wasn't no, true. reflecting something real. That's true. Um, so yes, I, I, that's an interesting thing the, the parallel with Six Feet Under I think that Swiss Army Man does go dark occasionally but it manages this this tightrope act of portraying dark you know, disturbing ideas but keeping it light at the same time mm-hmm. and that's a, that's a tough trick, I think that you know, mm. we were just talking about Six Feet Under and I think that Six feet under, for the most part, doesn't succeed in um, you know portraying dark light. things. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't succeed. It doesn't try. It doesn't try to though, does it? Yeah. <laughs> um, it has an occasional mo- occasional moments of lightness, but there are moments That's in awful. Swiss Army Man that you w- that you laugh, and then the next moment you want to cry because it's so sad. Hmm. Um, you know, Hank's relationship with Manny is touching and powerful, and you know, you laugh when when Manny Manny has sort of farting and and that kind of thing, and then when you realise that Hank is obsessed and being a bit of a stalker and being a bit of a strange guy with this woman, that's incredibly sad, and you know it's not something to be angry about. It's something to be sad about and think that there are people in the world that are like that that just can't have a connection with people um yeah i really really enjoyed this i i i snuck this in one afternoon um i think my wife was at uh, baby yoga um which is yoga where you can take your baby um mm-hmm. so i snuck as opposed in to as, as opposed to making shapes like the shapes that babies make yes that's right which are probably impossible for most adults to do because babies yeah. are like super flexible. Be um, impressive though. Oh yeah, very. Um, so yeah, I snuck this in. It's not a long film. It's uh, let me just check the running time. Uh, it's ninety-seven minutes. Yeah, so almost perfect in that regard. Um, never, never really feels like it outstays its welcome. I was very impressed with it I think it's the kind of thing that I will watch again and again just to mm-hmm. see you know if I've missed anything it's very good indeed so is it alright to um, make a film where you sympathise with with someone who's stalking someone is it alright um uh, I don't think that you have sympathy with him because of that. No. I think you have sympathy with him because of his, you know, his crushing social awkwardness and his inability to connect with people. I think that is thing. But it, it certainly doesn't portray... It doesn't portray his stalkery behaviour in a positive way. Yeah, it doesn't make him look like a noble stalker. No, no, not in the least. No, it definitely portrays it as being a bad thing to do. Okay. But it does balance Maybe that. Maybe it's all right then. Yeah, it does balance that with, you know, saying that he has terrible anxiety and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just going to read you the Rotten Tomatoes consensus. It has a 69% approval rating, which isn't that high. Um, no. But the consensus states, disarmingly odd and thoroughly well acted, Swiss Army Man offers adventurous viewers an experience as rewarding 
as it is impossible to categorize. So actually, that I would say that's a very positive um, summing up for a 69 Disarmingly approval. odd, did it say? It says, disarmingly odd, yes. Yeah, I think it sounds disarmingly odd. Yeah, it is disarmingly odd. I think that I, it, it is definitely hard to categorize. I don't know what you would say this what this kind of film was i suppose i suppose you say it's a character led piece really um rather than being a thriller or a it's a character led piece it's a character led piece <laughs> get to the chopper <laughs> yes um <laughs> variety uh this is a little excerpt from a variety review it says this movie wears its weirdness as a badge of honor as well mm-hmm. it should and i think that's what as, i like about as well it. we all should I think that's what I like about it is that yeah um it doesn't it, there's at no time do I sense that anything has been compromised to make this film it looks mm-hmm. like somebody's had this wacky mad idea and said okay let's make this film and then they made it and somebody you know th- there's various producers had faith in it to get it mm. made and yeah, I th- enough cash was cobbled together yeah to make, this, to make this bizarre movie and I'm fully Maybe on board with that. they showed them the farting scene. Yeah. Um, and then finally, uh, this is from The Hollywood Reporter, says it, a counterpoint to all the bodily function knockabout, which is the light stuff I was talking about, mm-hmm. Dana and Radcliffe, both fully committing with delectable zeal, project a certain tragic fragility that adds heft to the proceedings. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm just looking at the BBFC it's rated 15 which seems reasonable From comedy yeah. uh, comedy death yeah so difficult to categorise but it is committed and I think for our listener who has excellent taste mm. I hope um, I think mm. I think they would enjoy it a lot yeah well yeah yeah, it's hard to imagine our listener sometimes. But. It is. <laughs> it is hard to imagine our listener. But, um, I, I mean, I think of our listener as more like a stalker, really, than anything else. Well, I think that if we have a stalker, then we've arrived, haven't we? That's it. We're famous. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. okay, so... What's the point of it? Why is the world better because of Swiss Army Man? Okay, why is the world better for it? I think that um, <clears throat> I think that there aren't enough directors and writers in mainstream media because this year you know, this is a mainstream film. It got a mainstream release, although probably not a very big one, but it did get mm-hmm. a cinema release. I don't think there are enough people doing work of this kind. Um, Does it help us understand loneliness? Definitely, yes. I don't think it helps us understand death, right? Um, no, I don't think so. But it definitely, it definitely helps you to understand loneliness and despair. Despair, yeah. The crushing. Or is it just despair. an expression of despair? Is it just? Is it really the writer saying this is what I'm like? It's possible. Yeah, uh, I think that. That I think that if, if our listener has or knows people who have some kind of um you know social anxiety and panic attacks and those kind of things um they'll be able to relate to this film absolutely i mean <coughs> i think that yeah it's to go back to your point why why does it exist why does it need to exist i think it needs to exist because there aren't enough people in the world of entertainment and movies, making stuff like this that's this good. Mm. Um, and that's really important. That's that's my answer to that. Mm. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how film... You get film that is just avant-garde, deliberately inaccessible. Yes. Like, I'm thinking of um, art. So, you know, art that's trying to say something important is normally hard to enjoy yeah so you're talking about concept conceptual art yeah yeah and and modern classical music or you know anything like that yeah um 
That's a isn't good it point. interesting that in the world of film, you do get films that are hard to enjoy, but you also get films that are fairly easy to enjoy, but but are also artistic in this in a similar way. I yeah, that, think, that's maybe. a good point actually, because I don't think that Swiss Army Man is is difficult to enjoy. I think that um, I think that it might be a Marmite film in that someone mm-hmm. might turn it on and watch the first five minutes and then just turn it off and just think, oh, that's not going to, en- I'm not going to enjoy that. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it is fairly avant-garde. It, I suppose it is a bit conceptual in its delivery, but it is entertaining and funny and moving in those ways. Uh, I suppose in the way that um, uh, people like Peter Greenaway, who's British, mm. uh, what what we would consider to be sort of an art movie director who has actually made art movies that are accessible and fun and uh and and, and you know entertaining as well and managed mm-hmm. and managed to mold those things together i think swiss army man achieves that with a plum mm. but it may not be to everyone's taste so you know our listener uh just may not may not like it after the first five minutes i think if you can get past the first five minutes or even you know that's the wrong that's the wrong phrase (laughs) i think that if you are enjoying it after after the first five minutes then that's it you're in i think our listener probably has deep social anxiety i think that's possible and relates to the idea that the uh the only human they could truly get on with is a corpse yep that is possible so uh highly recommended from me Mm. um uh yeah it shows i think the film shows a great deal of skill in uh, in portraying what it portrays treads a fine line do you know what i watched a bit of last night what's that red oh with bruce willis yeah etc what did you think really really like it do you did you like it i watched it i watched it a few times before i I just really like it. It's just really well done. I thought it was good fun when I, I I've seen yeah. the first one. Uh, I don't think I've seen. I think I've the, seen the second one. Actually. I don't think this I've seen the, the first one. one. I, although if I have, I didn't enjoy it as much. But I did enjoy the yeah. first one. I thought it was good fun. It's surprisingly enjoyable. Yeah, it's quite light, isn't it? It doesn't take itself too seriously. It's very light. It's definitely Bruce Willis doing Die Hard, differently. Uh, yeah. Helen Mirren, um, John Malkovich, yeah. Malkovich. Yeah, John Malkovich is fantastic. He is good, and, isn't he? as he is in everything. Yeah, yeah, he is great. Never knowing, no scenery left unchewed with uh, Malkovich. <laughs> yeah, and that's certainly true in that film. Yeah, it is, but but that's what you're <laughs> expecting. I'm not expecting a subtle Malkovich performance. <laughs> Malkovich, 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 Malkovich. Um. Okay, so sorry. Have, have, <laughs> but, yeah. have we covered Swiss, Swiss Army Man? I think so. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So let's. It I'm sounds gonna, I'm good. Gonna, I definitely want to watch it. Definitely. Yeah, it I sounds think, to me like I think you would like it. Something that's been enabled by films like American Pie. Um, but American that's Pie. Something interesting. That's, you know, like stupid farting films. Oh, I see. Yes. Have somehow made something like that. Possible. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and in that limited way, films that are full of fart have case. shown that they have value. Yeah, farts do have value. They can get you from an island to the mainland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wanted to cu- I wanted to talk about a couple of other things before we get on to our plugging. Go for it. Um, I went to see Wonder Woman on Wednesday. Did it have a lot of things crashing into other things uh, and going? <laughs> Yes, I think it did. Right. Yeah, but but uh, it looked a bit like it was just going to be another film with things crashing into things. There is, yeah, I mean, there is that. It's a superhero movie, so uh, that is to be expected. So, but I took my I took my son to see it, who was really mm-hmm. really interested in seeing it, mm-hmm. because we both agree that um, Wonder Woman is by far and away the best thing about uh, Batman versus Superman: colon, Dawn of Justice. Colon. Colon. Um, and, okay, uh, I didn't realise she was in that. Yeah, she is. She is briefly in that, and she's really right. good. You know, she really right. lifts the tone of the film. 
from being this sort of turgid bore fest in you know into a proper superhero movie to colon based exploding colon helicopter. based exploding yeah i think they're pretty sure there is an exploding helicopter in bvs colon dodge as, colon. as nobody's calling it um <laughs> Uh, but yes, Wonder Woman is excellent. I have to report. Oh really? Yeah, it's really, really good. And that, and I think a lot of that is. Oh, but I have to calibrate. Did you like the Avengers? I liked the first Avengers. I didn't like Old oh, Age of Ultron much. Yeah. See, I thought the first Avengers was just barely watchable. Okay. No, I really liked the first one. But pretty dull, even though it's directed by Joss my Whedon. Hero. Joss Whedon, who has blamed more people for the failure of his shows than just taking responsibility for the fact that they failed. Which shows? Well, things like Firefly, Firefly. and um, Firefly Dollhouse. Firefly did It got cancelled. Uh, it's not the same as failing. Well, getting cancelled is <laughs> is bad. Yeah, but it's now a cult. Yes, it is. Didn't, didn't help him, though, did it? Um, no, but, he only went on to he did make, direct major he, Hollywood movies. He did make Serenity, though, which I which I enjoyed. Of money. And make Serenity, which I really like. Yeah, I do like Serenity. Um, um, and Dollhouse is really good as well. Yeah, I couldn't get into Dollhouse. I, it I did took try. me a long time. I did try. I gave up on it, and I someone gave me the DVDs, and I sat through them, mm. and it won me over eventually, and I really liked it. Mm. But obviously... In case our listeners not surely our listeners are aware, probably not. But all of this is about Buffy, right? So the reason why Joss is worth talking about is Buffy. because of Buffy. Because of Buffy. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, probably my favourite TV series oh, ever. I don't know. I really Twin like Peaks. Northern Exposure. Oh, Northern Exposure is so good. And I really like The Prisoner. Um, what about Twin Peaks? No, it's fine. But it's not up there with The Prisoner, Northern Exposure and Buffy the Vampire Twin Peaks is way better than Northern Exposure. I don't really think anything's better than Northern Exposure. Yeah, it is. I started watching... um, I sat my wife down to watch the first couple of episodes of Twin Peaks and she was really impressed. Mm. Really impressed. My wife's a big fan. We've got it in the loft. She's going to get it down and we're going to re-watch it. In preparation for Series 3. Well, yeah, although it'll probably take decades before that comes onto a platform that we are prepared to not pay for. I'm pretty sure it'll it'll be quite soon. Um, yeah, I think oh, it'll really? be sooner than that, yeah. Um, so, yes, Wonder Woman is good. I would in- encourage our listener to go and see it. What's good about it? Okay, it's it's um, it stars an actress called Gal Gadot, or Gal Gadot, depending on how you pronounce her name, who's very, very good in the role of Diana, or Wonder Woman, although she's never called Wonder Woman in the film, because that, mm-hmm. that's a silly name. Personally, it I, is. <laughs> it's a silly name. Um, but the movie is directed by a director called Patty, Patty Jenkins, um, and what she brings to it is a female director's eye. So, yeah, you know, the movie starts on a hidden island somewhere in the Mediterranean that is populated by the the Amazon women. And I feel that if it was a, a male director, we see a lot of scenes of these women hunting and shooting and fighting and training and this kind of thing. But it's not, none of it's done using the male gaze. You know, it's not kind of like mm. war. It's just, you know, these women are doing what they do. Mm-hmm. And that tone stays for the rest of the film mm-hmm. in that uh, it's, you know, none of it's leery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that is really important for a film like this. Um, mm. So yeah, it's really good. I think it's really good. I was thinking earlier on that if it was a male director, would you have got the same kind of tone? And I don't know the answer to that question. I think that I think that Joss Whedon might have done it. You know, I think that he managed to portray most of Buffy without kind of being leery and going war, but not all the time. Yeah. So. And Dollhouse, I think, was also a serious attempt to behave like that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But what? Pat- and there's plenty yeah. of female directors who've made leery films as well. There are, yes, there are indeed. But, um, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, Wonder Woman succeeds because of that, uh, that. That there's no leeriness, and that's important. And it's doing really well. 
at the box office and getting great reviews, which is really good to see because mm. it's good to see if, excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> drying up. It's good to see a, uh, well, here we go. <coughs> you might have to cut that. <coughs> He's welling up, listener. Oh, dear. It's good to see a female-led superhero film. That actually feels like one. Yes. There have been others. There have been others that don't feel like they're led by they're by a female. They're, they're, they feel like they they are just paying lip service to it. Whereas this is okay. most definitely... Uh, she's most definitely the lead. Okay. Yeah. Um, what else did I watch? I watched... We spoke. I was always a big fan of um, Batman Returns. Oh yeah, it's good that, isn't it? With um, That's... with Catwoman. Yeah. But I don't think that could be accused of not being leery. No, it's definitely leery. But how can it? How can it not be leery if it's Catwoman? That that started a long, a lifelong interest in Michelle Pfeiffer for me. <clears throat> Michelle Per Pfeiffer. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, that's that's all I have to say. Okay, fair enough. Um, it's a great, it's a great film. The other thing that I watched, we spoke on the on our chat about Wanna Cry. I brought up, a, I think I brought up a movie mm-hmm. called Zero Days, all about the Stuxnet well, you virus. You did bring up at least one movie, yeah. Yeah. So I watched that in in the intervening time between that podcast mm-hmm. and this one. Okay. And it's very interesting. Um, and I encourage our listener to track it down um, somehow. It was on. It was on was BBC it hard Four. To track down? Well, I don't know. It, it had a limited cinema release, and then it was straight on the television. So, is it a documentary? Yes, it is. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, it's called Zero Days, directed by Alex Gibney. Um, is it in the style of that um, Ed, Ed Snowden film? Uh, what um, snow documentary? That oh, the snow. Oh, sorry. The uh, uh, I haven't seen that. What's that called? Ah, uh, it's called for. It's called the citizen. Oh yeah, that's right. Yes, citizen. What something? something. Let me look it up. Anyway, yeah, I think it's the same director. Really good. Uh, oh, is it? I was wondering whether it's. Yeah, I, I think it is. Lines. What's it? What is it? Citizen, citizen Four. I think it's called. Is it? Yes. Oh, no, it's a different director. Uh, no, I haven't seen that, but it's um, really good. <clears throat> Alex Gibney is it, a. It, it yeah. may or may not be a clever propaganda, but it completely turned around my opinion of Ed Snowden from not sure whether he's all right mm. to think he's a complete hero of our time. Well, that's interesting because that, that was mainly through interviews with him that made that turned my opinion around. I that's interesting because I thought. When when the story broke, I immediately thought that he was a massive hero. I just thought this this is a man who has been earning a heck of a lot of money. He's been in a in a position of great influence and responsibility. And if he thinks that we need to hear this stuff, then we should listen to him. Uh, and that's what I thought about. And I haven't changed my mind on that at all. I think that he is a true hero. It's worth watching interviews with him whenever you get a chance. Okay. Actually, he's he's um, he speaks very well on this subject. Excellent. Um, so yes, Alex Gibney's you can follow also him on made... Twitter as well. Sorry, sorry. That's all right. Alex Gibney's also made um, he made a movie in 2013 called The Armstrong Lie, which is uh, all about Lance Armstrong and mm-hmm. you know he basically broke the he broke the story about right. Lance Armstrong being a drugs cheat. Right. Um, and this is the this is the bloke that made um that made zero, zero day. day. Yeah, zero days. Mm-hmm. And in 2015 uh he made a movie all about Frank Sinatra called All or Nothing at All, which I ha- I have yet to watch. Mm-hmm. But I'm looking forward to that. So tell me a bit more about Zero Day. Okay. Does it cover the um, computery bits? Yeah, it does. So it talks about the, the Stuxnet virus was developed by the NSA and Mossad jointly um, mm-hmm. with the ultimate aim of, I think we talked about this in the last podcast, but with the ultimate aim of shutting down Iranian nuclear centrifuges. Mm-hmm. Um, it was supposed to be a joint operation, but Mossad went ahead and used it independently and then somehow it got onto the internet 
and started infecting random machines. And the virus, mm. the way the virus works, it runs on Windows and it finds a process on a Windows machine that has a timer. And for these centrifuges, that's quite important because they run at very, very high RPMs and are designed to only run for a certain amount of time at mm -hmm. this high RPM. So it finds something with a timer and it tells the timer to just forget it, just keep running forever. Mm -hmm. And this causes these centrifuges to then blow up. Mm -hmm. which is irreparable damage and they just need to be replaced right so that that's what it was designed for but does it cause like a meltdown not a meltdown no because there was no actual live it's not inside a reactor okay. these centrifuges are there to kind of purify the yellow cake uranium yellow cake uranium yellow cake yellow cake <laughs> it's a made up drug yellow cake it's a made up drug um, so yeah it was designed to do that but, but it got into the wild and caused all kinds of trouble and it was only when folks from Norton and Symantec and folks like that got their hands on it they started analysing it and they realised that there was more to it than this wasn't a virus that had been knocked up in someone's bedroom it had been put together by professionals and there was a whole load of code in there that just wasn't being used or doing anything so these centrifuges uh, presumably have very small embedded computers one wonders why they're running windows don't know i think um the fact that they were running windows is a bounty for people who want to shut them down <laughs> basically odd choice oh, there, were, there was a time where windows was the only thing there was really so yeah so i think maybe that's it i should think that uh <sighs> But what what this what this caused though, just briefly, I know this isn't what we're here to talk about, but um what it caused was for for the Iranians to um launch a cyber attack on a Saudi Arabian oil company and basically fry shut down all their computers and then they launched a denial of service attack on a, on an American bank as a retaliation. And it was that mm -hmm. that prompted the Obama administration to start talking to the Iranian administration about slowing down their nuclear program in, in exchange for uh, lifting some sanctions and food aid and that kind of thing. So there was something positive that came out of it. But yeah, it's a, it's a really, really, really interesting documentary in that mm. it talks about, um, it compares the proliferation of computer viruses and cyber hacking to nuclear, um, the nuclear program, in that once the demon's out of the box, it can never be put back in again. Mm. And once you hack somebody and they hack you, and then it just carries on. It's just an escalation of cyber warfare. Mm. Um, you're never going to make a secure system. No, exactly. And also these days, you're never going to be able to get most of your systems to be off the internet no i mean some of them you have it that's right that's right so it is it is yeah it's really interesting I, I think if our listener can find it i watched it on bbc4 they might repeat mm. it at some point they probably will yeah does the film speculate about how stuxnet got out it does but i can't remember um mm. how that happened mm. um yeah but it is certainly of interest uh, yeah. I think that's all my other business this week. Cool. Hmm. Let's do some plugging. All right. Uh, shall I start? Go for it. Shall I do this one by myself? <laughs> What's that from? Uh, it's from um, Unplugged in New York, Nirvana's album, where he's, uh, right. Kurt Cobain sings Penny Royalty. Yeah. And he says, shall yeah, I do this it's one haunting. by myself? Yeah, so I present a um, radio show on Glastonbury FM 107.1 in the Glastonbury Street and Wells area. That's that's Glastonbury Street and Wells. <laughs> Wells area of Somerset. Uh, it's a movie, reviews and music and DVDs. And now TV, I've started talking about television. So on the last show, I talked about American Gods and also... Um, 
a show called The Handmaid's Tale, which is currently showing on Channel 4. Yeah, Talked it's about. annoying. It's good. But it's got, it's it's got good. the uh, woman out of Mad Men in it. Yeah, it's really good. She's good. I just... Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, but no, I should like it, really, because it's not actually a costume drama, right? It's a dystopian... It's a dystopian... Uh, alternative thing. history. Yeah, that's right. It's based on Margaret Atwood's novel. Yeah, I should read all the Margaret Atwood books. She's so good. Her stuff is really, really good. Um, so, yeah, I talked about that. Uh, I cover cinema schedules locally. It's on between 6 and 7 on a Thursday and repeated between 2 and 3 on, on a Friday. There are also and It's on the internet. It's on the internet as well. So, yeah, if you go... Live and not live. Uh, yep. There are podcast highlights if you search for movie mashup, one word. In your podcasting app of choice, then you'll find it. That's it. Over to you. Cool. Uh, uh, towards the end of this month, I'm running a workshop for for and with the organisation called Women Who Code, which is an organisation of women who code. <laughs> uh, Do they code and they're women? Yeah, uh, so it's like um, uh, people of all different levels of experience getting together and, and learning a technology or a particular um, thing to do with programming. Um, uh, uh, it's a really cool thing. And how can really excited? How can people find out about this on the internet and sign up for so, it if they haven't already? So women who code. Uh, I think it's WWC London is the Twitter handle. That's one of the best ways to find out what they're doing. Okay. I'm I'm afraid this thing is like booked up and over doubly overbooked. So it's probably unlikely you'll make if you haven't already booked on the. It's a, what's the oh it's a Eventbrite I think it's one of these event um, things they have a booking system but it's okay. Uh, this particular event's booked up but I highly recommend Women Who Code. It's a cool place that people are really friendly and uh, um and where is it where is it taking place technologies. it's taking place in clerkenwell oh. in the trendy part of london Blimey. that's a bit hipster at a, at, uh, at an office space called fora fora who are kindly providing the hosting and my company open market are providing um the workshop that we're doing and uh, some food and stuff so good on them that's most excellent and the workshop that we're doing is uh, write your own programming language. Ah. And during that evening, we are going to write a little programming language. Excellent. Which you have experience cool. of. Yeah. But th I made an even smaller language so that we can write it all together in a... Nice. In a workshop setting. So, um, yeah, if you like the sound of that, um, maybe you should, like, I don't know, send a tweet to Women Who Code asking them to do another one or something. Yeah, but I'm quite nervous about it, but excited about it, and because I, I went to one of the women who code things before, despite not being a woman, because we were hosting one at our office, um, and uh, I was really impressed with the people. It's really cool. That sounds great. So I'm very excited to be part of it. If only I was a woman, it would be even better. Well, but you can't be everything. You can be. Look at the Wachow the, Wach the Wachowskis, are now both right. women. Oh really? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I think I'd need more motivation than just wanting to be part of an organisation. Fair enough. Obviously, you can yeah. already code, so you don't need to become a woman to code. No, it is okay for people who aren't women to code. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is, listener. Yes. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, like I, I make YouTube videos and I've got a blog about programming and lots of open source projects. And you should go on the Google Play Store and buy Rabbit Escape for 60p or get the same thing without paying any money by looking for Rabbit Escape free. Or you can get it off the Amazon store or the F-Droid store, which is a nice open source Android mm. app store. Um, the It's remarkable how few people have downloaded the free version of Rabbit Escape. It really is. Oh, really? You mean most people have bought it? Well... Almost no one has downloaded the free version. Oh dear. Whereas, whereas more than almost no one bought the uh, pay for version. I, although I, practically no one. I has paid for it, it on the Amazon store. Did you? Yes. And it works. Yeah, you told me. Oh it no, works. it works. I'm just stuck on it. 
And it awesome. frustrated me, so I gave up. There are <laughs> there are in depth hints. There are, yes. But even with the hints, I was just like, ah. Uh, well, I must get round to adding the feature where it, it just gives you a walkthrough. That would be excellent. Yeah. But I haven't. Um, hmm. Anyway, Rabbit Escape. It's like Lemmings, which, if you remember Lemmings, that's enough to sell it already. Yeah. If you don't remember Lemmings, well, it's well, one of the best puzzle action ever. games that's ever existed. Ever, yeah. And there's various. So play a version of it. There's various sort of versions of Lemmings, isn't there? Is there one called Pingu's? Yes, there's a lovely open source um, clone of Lemmings, which works on Linux and Windows, which is called Pingu's. Yeah. Which is basically trying to be pretty much an updated version of Lemmings. Mm. Rabbit Escape is intended to be a sort of updated version of Lemmings, but particularly um, designed to be easy to use on a phone or a tablet using a touch interface. Yeah. So you don't have to be quite so accurate with your clicks. Yeah, it definitely is. It definitely works on a touch interface. Definitely. Loot. They mostly come at night. It looks boring. Mostly. Maybe I should make it look more interesting. <laughs> it sounds like you're but quite busy with other things. <laughs> <laughs> I drew all the graphics myself. What more do they want? <laughs> uh, someone who's good at drawing things to draw them. Someone who is good at the drawing fools. things. The fools. If only there was some. Uh, I've just noticed the dog is not sitting in his bed. He's sitting on the sofa instead. <laughs> It's because I'm distracted by something, you see. He's like, yeah, screw you, human. <laughs> cool, I think that's probably, that's probably the end. I think the that's end. probably the end, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, I had a really nice time hearing about... Uh, Swiss Army uh, Man. Swiss Army Man. Yeah. Uh, did you watch, um, just before we sign off, did you watch uh -huh. uh, Point Blank yet? Yes. Did you? I think pretty sure I've told you, no, you on air that I did. No, no, it? hang on. No, you haven't told me on air. Because the last time we spoke about this, I said the next time we speak, I want to make sure you've watched it. So you have watched it now. I have watched it. Uh, and I thought it was extremely tense. Yeah. And powerful. And possibly deliberately, uh, the... All the women, whenever there's a woman in the frame, it's horrible because she's under massive threat all the time, even when she's with someone who's supposed to be a good guy. Yeah. And I found that really uncomfortable, and I think that was probably it showing its age and showing that it comes from a time where yeah. uh, uh, women were like treated as objects in that kind of... I think, that's, I think you're right. It is definitely That is definitely of its time. You have to take that into the context of... It's, that was really uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, I didn't. I liked. Did I like it? I thought it was. It is. I, saw, I definitely saw what was good about it. Um, it's very stylish. I didn't like it as much as I like Payback. No, no, I can see that. I don't think I like it as much as Payback either. But I think it is. Mm -hmm. interest, it's always interesting to see a film that is the original of a of yeah. a not a remake, but maybe like a, you know, mm. a different someone's different version of a story. Um, yeah. It's interesting I guess to see. Often, that. often when you do that, it's a film that you really value. That you know, the newer one is one you really value. So it's probably not surprised then if the older one's not quite as good. Yeah, true enough. There's, for example, I I really love twenty first century schizoid man. The cover by Shining. Oh, I haven't heard that. The the um, King Crimson. Are they a black? Are they a black metal? There are there some I don't know the terms for them, but they're very very heavy. Mm. And yes, it's a King Crimson. It's a cover of King Crimson song. I'd never heard of King King Crimson. It made me interested in them because I loved this song so much. Yeah. And I went and listened to their version, and that's fine. But it's nothing to the version by Shining. Interesting. Yeah. It's so good. I recommend listener that you go and look up Twenty First Century Schizoid Man or Twentieth. I don't know. Whichever it is. Go and listen to both and then give us some feedback. Yeah, no, yeah, that'd be interesting to get some feedback on that. Yeah. Uh, have you seen Arrival yet? No. Okay. But I, people talk about it from time to time. It seems to have entered the national consciousness. Yeah, it's it's excellent. It's excellent. So I should. Uh, yeah, you should. Yeah. Uh, that's it. 
I think. That's it. Yes. Cool. See you next time. Thank you very much.